welcome up our friend and good servant, Hutch. All right, thanks, Ron. If you have a Bible, we'll be finding your way over to the book of Exodus chapter 3. That's our text this morning as we continue in our journey through studying the life of Moses. And uh, we're studying the life of Moses, but really what we're doing is, is we're coming to learn to understand more and more about our Heavenly Father. You see, this is his story. Moses is a part of that story. You're a part of that story. I'm a part of that story. But this is really God's story. And uh, I want us to see that in our time together this morning. It was a, a fall Sunday morning, beautiful, bright, crisp. The wife had gotten up and had taken care of getting the kids fed and dressed. She was dressed. She walks into the bedroom. She sees that her husband, to her surprise, is still in the bed. She says, come on, you got to get up, got to get going. We're going to be late for church. He says, I don't want to go. She says, what do you mean you don't want to go? He says, I just don't want to go. She goes, well, give me three good reasons why you don't want to go. She said, he said, well, number one, those people aren't friendly down there at that church. Number two, everybody hates me. Number three, I just don't want to do it. I don't want to go. Well, she said, well, let me give you three good reasons why you need to go. There are some friendly people down there at that church. Not everyone there hates you and you're the pastor. Get up. We got to go. <laughs> and so this morning we got a little bit of an unusual title. And as we go through our study this morning, you may be thinking to yourself, when are you going to get to it? When are you going to get to it? When are you going to get to it? We're going to get to it at the end. We're going to talk about how to make God mad. You know, I was encouraged this morning as I walked in because I didn't see something. What I didn't see this morning was the fact that everyone here today does not have a drug problem. You say, Hutch, how do you know that? I know that because it's a cool, crisp November Friday morning. And I looked in the parking lot and I looked in the walkway on the way in and I did not see one set of heels that had been drug into this place. Now, having pastored for 35 years, I've gone to church uh, nearly every Sunday in those 35 years and I always see a drug problem. Teenagers are drugged to church. Husbands are drugged to church. Whether it's by your grandparents, your parents, or somebody, people are always being drugged to church. But on a Friday morning... Here we are in this beautiful gymnasium together to study the word of God. And none of us have a drug problem because we came here because we wanted to be here. We are so glad that you are indeed here. Hey, listen, we are studying this amazing man's life by the name of Moses. And uh, we have been journeying pretty slow through this. We, we spent a week talking about the, the miraculous sovereignty of God in action, not only through Moses' birth, but the fact that he got to stay alive when there was an edict for all of the Jewish baby boys to be put to death. So we saw that miracle take place. We saw that not only was he saved from being killed, but he was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. And he was taken into the royal family. And for 40 years of his life, he lived in the royal palace of Egypt with the very best that everything this world had to offer was at his fingertips. But at the age of 40, as he was walking one day, he saw something that captured his attention. It's a theme that we see in Moses' life. He seems to just be minding his own business walking around and somehow something captures his attention. And he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. He has a sense of his destiny, which is to be a deliverer. But he's about 40 years too early in fulfilling that destiny because he takes matters into his own hands. He acts impulsively. He separates the Hebrew from the Egyptian, ends up striking the Hebrew, killing him. He hides him in the sand, thinking that nobody will see it. He'll get away with it and all is well. Till the next day, as he's walking around, something else catches his attention. This time, there are two guys fighting. There's not an Egyptian and a Hebrew. These are two Hebrews. And so he speaks to the two Hebrews, especially to the one who is the aggressor. And he says, what are you doing? Stop this. Don't, don't, don't hurt a brother. And the guy looks at him and says, who made you a prince and ruler over us? You're going to do to me what you did to that Egyptian yesterday? And all of a sudden, 
Moses is faced with the fact that he has committed a capital crime in Egypt in killing an Egyptian. And so he comes from being the favored son in the line to become Pharaoh to now he is on the run. And he runs to the back side of the desert, a place called Midian, and, and there he ends up spending the next 40 years of his life. And so in just a few short verses, we see the first 80 years of Moses' life and everything meaningful in Moses' life didn't happen until after he was 80. And I want you to stop and think about that for a second. Anybody in here 80 or older? Anybody, anybody. All right, you still got hope. A few more years for some of us, a lot more for others. Exodus 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Israel, of Israel, out of Egypt? Now you remember, as we continued that story, that Moses, again, noticed something one day as he was tending his father-in-law's sheep on the backside of the desert in the shadow of Mount Horeb. He saw a bush that was on fire. It wasn't so amazing that the bush was on fire. It was a dry and arid region. That was a common thing to see. But what, what stood out about this particular bush is, is that it was on fire, but it didn't burn up. There was no ashes. It didn't destroy. The fuel didn't run out. It says, I, I'm going to stop and go over and look at this. And as he does, he gets closer and he notices that the fire is in the midst of the bush. And the fire in the midst of the bush calls him by name. Moses, Moses. And Moses gave the exact correct response. Here I am. When God calls you, that's the way to respond. It's not wait. It's not uh, push that little red button that says ignore or unanswered. He says, here I am. But Moses said to God, they're having a conversation. Who am I? God had given him some marching orders that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. He said, he said, that is God, but I will be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? Who better? Who better to go back to Pharaoh than Moses? He knew the ways of the Egyptians. He knew the landscape. He knew the temperature and the culture. He spent 40 years of his life there. But what Moses is focuses on is the last 40 years that he spent on the backside of the desert. And he says, listen, I, 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 I'm not your guy. But what I want us to see is our message truth. And you have to correct it. There's an error in your bifold on the front page there. And that message truth is simply this. It's not about who you are. It's about who God is. That's our one sentence takeaway this morning. It's not about who you are. It's not about who I am. It's about who God is. That's what this whole story is all about. And in this conversation between God and Moses, Moses gives God five excuses. And I want us to look at each of these five excuses this morning and find out just exactly how is it that you make God mad. Excuse number one Moses gave to God was this. Why I can't do what you have asked me to do. Why I can't do what I, you have instructed me to do. Excuse number one is this, is I have failed in the past. I have failed in the past. And what Moses was saying here is this, and maybe you can relate. You may have felt this way at some point in your time in your life, is I am unworthy. I am unworthy to do what it is, God, that you are calling me to do. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go? Of all the shepherds on the backside of the desert, why did you pick me? I think you've made a mistake here, God. Uh, you don't understand, I have blown it in the past. I have made mistakes. I have committed sins. Oh, by the way, there's this little issue of murder, which is the whole reason why I am out here in the desert to begin with. 
I'm an unworthy candidate for you to use. Look at verse 12. He that is God said, but I will be with you. Let that soak in for a second. Remember, Moses, it's not about you. It's about me. Moses, this is my story. Moses, it's not up to you. Moses, it's about me. He said, but I will be with you and this shall be a sign for you. And then notice the sign that God gives to him. You have, that you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. He says, right here where we are right now, I'm telling you one day after you bring them out, you're going to serve me. You're going to worship me right here. Mount Horeb. Mount Sinai. This is the place. And God was basically telling Moses, here's the solution to this problem of you thinking that, that you are unworthy. First of all, take your eyes off of yourself and put them on me. Can I ask you a question today? Who do you think about the most during the course of your day? Is it your spouse? Is it your children? Is it your parents? Is it your neighbor? Co-workers? You? Yes. You think about you far more than you think about anybody else. You think about you more than everyone else combined over the course of a day. You are your number one focus. But God says to Moses, listen, it's not about you. So take your eyes off of yourself and put them on sovereign God. Secondly, he says, take your eyes off of your past sins and put them onto God's forgiveness. You're feeling unworthy today? If you know Jesus Christ as your real and personal savior, every sin that you've ever committed is covered by the blood, the sinless perfect, redeeming blood of the Lord Jesus, which was shed for you on Calvary's cross. So take your eyes off of your past failures and put them on God's forgiveness. Take your eyes off yourself, put them on sovereign God. Take your eyes off your past failures, put them on my grace, my forgiveness, God says. And then thirdly, this, he says this, he says, take your eyes off of your own mistakes and put them on God's mercy. Where would we be today without God's mercy? Excuse number two. The second excuse Moses gives is this. Maybe you've used this one before. When God's calling you to take that two-year-old Bible study class and teach it. I don't know enough. I don't know enough, Moses says. And what Moses was saying here is this, is I'm unsure. What if those two-year-olds ask me a theological question that I can't answer? Or what if you're calling me to share the good news of the gospel with someone over lunch that I'm doing business with. And it's obvious you have opened the door. But I don't know enough. What if they ask me a theological question and I can't answer? How about this? Just try this on for size. That's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I promise you, I am going to go and find the answer and I will get back with you and let you know. Do you know what happens when that takes place? You grow. You mature in your faith. Verse 13, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? He says, listen, I'm so dumb in this stuff. I don't even know what your name is. Now names for God was a big thing in the culture in which Moses was raised in Egypt. They had a God for everything. They had a God by the name of Apis. 
He was the, a bull. He was the, the God of livestock. They had a God by the, the name of Ra, who was the sun God. They had a God by the name of Osiris, who was the God of the Nile. They had a God by a goddess by the name of Heka. She was the frog goddess. How would you like to go in that one when they're handing out names? All right, you be the sun God. You be the animal kingdom God. You be the God of the mighty Nile. And you, you get to be the goddess of the frogs. I think she got shortchanged on this stick. But, but, but all that means is, is this. Moses knew all of the Egyptian God's names, but he didn't know the God of all God's names. And so God introduces himself. Verse 14, listen to what he says. He answers his question. He says, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's a strange name. It's not like George. It's not like Ra. Doesn't carry with it the oomph of Zeus. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. Now, this name, as best we can tell, is the name Yahweh. And Yahweh could be interpreted four different ways. And all of them would be correct. One of the ways is this. It could be interpreted, I am who I am. It could be interpreted, I, I am what I am. It could be interpreted as, I will be who I will be. Or it could be interpreted as, I will be what I will be. Basically, this name Yahweh, which later is translated for us into Jehovah, is this. The ever and all becoming one. I become to you whatever you need. So when we see God's name, and he becomes to us whatever we need, when you have a need, God becomes Jehovah Jireh. I meet your needs. When you need healing, God becomes to you Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. When you're going through tumultuous situations in life, God becomes to you Jehovah Shalom, your peace. He says, whatever you need, that's who I am. Whoever you need, I am. Did you notice that in the New Testament, Jesus took that name? And he said things like, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the door. And every time he was invoking the name of Yahweh, Jehovah God. Corey Tin Boom, that, that great faith-filled woman who harbored and brought to safety Jews during the Holocaust said this, and I quote, never be afraid to trust an unknown future into the hands of a known God. Excuse number one, I failed in the past. I am unworthy. Excuse number two, I don't know enough. I am unsure. Excuse number three, they won't listen to me. And what Moses was saying when he said, they won't listen to me, is this, is I am unprepared. He goes on, move with me now to chapter 14. Or chapter 4, verse 1, sorry, it should be chapter 4. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Moses is, is saying, listen, I, I'm afraid, to be quite honest with you, they're not going to believe me. Who's going to believe that I was just simply tending sheep on the backside of the desert, saw a bush caught on fire, heard your voice, and you've called me to come back and to deliver them from bondage that they've been in for 400 years. Man's fear is the biggest hindrance to doing the will of God. You're scared. When you have a clear sense of call of what God wants you to do, you're scared, so you don't do it. 
in 2011. At that point in time, I had been in pastoral ministry as a lead pastor or a staff pastor for over 25 years. And it became obvious that God was leading and directing me and my family to step away from what we knew, to step away from what we were comfortable with, to step away from a, a check that you knew was going to come in, and called us to start a nonprofit of which I had no experience in, to work with adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so Cindy and I started the Pierce Center for Life in Richmond. We didn't know where any money was coming from. We didn't know if anybody wanted to use the program. We didn't know how to start. But step by step, God said, I know you're scared. I know you're uncomfortable. I would tell people all the time what we were doing and they would shake their head and think, what in the world are you doing? Sometimes that's how you know it's God calling you to do it. Because it doesn't make any sense in the human perspective how it's going to get done. God says, I like to work in that situation because that way you don't get the glory, I get the glory. When you don't have the skill, when you don't have the experience, when you don't have the so-called abilities, except availability, then I can work through you and I can get something done. And then after that, we won't go through all of this, but, but the Lord gives them some clear instructions. You see, Moses made the same mistake that men make all the time. Moses made the mistake of associating his job, a shepherd, with who he was. Hi, your name's Ryan. Ryan, what do you do? Everything. Everything. We just call you Yahweh from now on, buddy. <laughs> you got it? I order your carpet. <laughs> Yeah, 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 whatever. When you introduce yourself, what do you say? Well, I, I'm in the IT industry. I'm a carpenter. I'm a plumber. I'm a mechanic. I'm a, I'm a this or I'm a that. That's not who you are. That's what you do. Moses says, I am a shepherd on the backside of the desert. I don't walk into Pharaoh's household, into his office, point a finger in his face and say, let my people go. That's not who I am. That's not what I do. But then God gives him three miraculous signs. Man, I wish we had some time. You guys just don't listen fast enough. Come on now, listen. The first one was, he, he says to Moses, he says, what is in your hand? And Moses says, it's a staff. And you know what a staff is, right? A staff is a stick. But after 40 years in the wilderness, it's a stick that, that Moses is very comfortable with. You know what I'm saying, right? You're very comfortable with some tools. There's some tools you don't want to loan out because you've used them so many times, they custom fit to your hand. You're hoping your son-in-law doesn't come over and ask to use that particular hammer. You sure do not want your wife using it because this screwdriver is the best screwdriver in my whole toolkit. I've got 37 screwdrivers in this box and my wife wants to take the best one. And she's going to use it as a hammer to hang a picture. But he says, this is a staff. God says, do me a favor, throw it on the ground. And when he throws it on the ground, it becomes a snake. Now, when we read this text, it seems like God just then says, well, hey, pick it up by the tail. Guess what? The Bible also says that Moses ran away. So it didn't happen like this. If it's me... It's about an hour and a half later before I get enough courage to go pick up that snake. And Moses, who was a shepherd, knew better than to pick a snake up by the tail. Why? Because if you pick it up by the tail, it can still attack you. 
You pick up a snake behind its head right on its neck so that you can control the dangerous end of the snake. It was an act of faith. The stick goes down, it becomes a snake. He picks it up by the tail, it becomes a stick again. God says, listen, put your hand inside your, 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 your garment. He sticks his hand inside his garment, he pulls it out, it's leprous. He says, put it back in. He puts it back in, he pulls it out. It's, it's as good as new. And then he says, hey, try this one for size. But he couldn't do this. And Moses had to do this by faith, Mark. Listen to this. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to take some water out of the Nile. I want you to pour it onto the ground and it's going to become blood on the ground. Hey, Moses wasn't by the Nile. He couldn't do it right then. He had to wait till he had been obedient. Man, number four. Here we go. Come on. Running out of time. Excuse number four. You ready? Write this down. Moses says, I don't have the abilities necessary to do the job. I don't have the abilities necessary to do the job. Moses basically says here, I am unable. I am unable. Verse 10, chapter four. But Moses said to the Lord, oh my God, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And God says to Moses once again, Moses, it's not about you. It's about me. You have a problem understanding this very simple sentence, this very simple, basic truth. And he asked him who made man's tongue, who made man's mouth. And Moses has to understand, it is God. And God can do with a tongue whatever he wants to do. If he can take a bush and make it speak, he can use your tongue to do what it is he's called you to do. You understand that, right? And this is uncomfortable this morning because every single one of us are thinking, God has asked me, God has called me, God has instructed me, God has led me to do this. And I'm using all the exact same excuses Moses did. Moses was looking at his perceived weaknesses instead of looking at the strength of his God. But know this today. God places a higher premium on your availability than he does on your ability. You understand that, right? If you just simply say, here I am. Somebody else said that, didn't they, in Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah the prophet saw God high and lifted up and exalted. And God said, who will go for us and whom shall I send? And Isaiah jumps up and says, here am I, send me. Moses, on the other hand, said, here am I, send somebody else. All right, we're going to take a break. We're going to get around the tables because we can't handle the rest of this right now. We're gonna come back, wrap this up in a few minutes. Let's break to the table, shall we? Seems like we had some good conversation around the tables. The volume kept going up and up and up as we finished uh, our time together around the tables. And what we've seen today is that Moses had five excuses. The first one Moses said is, is this, I can't do it because I'm unworthy. The second excuse is, is that I can't do it because I am unsure. The third excuse is, is I can't do it because I'm unprepared. The fourth excuse was, is I can't do it because I'm unable. And then now we get down to excuse number five. And you want to write this in, all right? Here we go. Excuse number five, Moses gave God why he could not do what he was calling him to do is this. And it really is the bottom line. It should have been the first one, but it's the last one. I just really don't want to do it. (laughs) 
And Moses was saying here, I am unwilling. Look at what it says. Exodus 4, verse 13. But Moses said, oh, my Lord, please send somebody else. But look at God's response. Verse 14. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. How do you make God mad? God, I know what you want me to do. I have clarity and I know that because my wife told me what to do. It's funny sometimes how the Holy voice of the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like our wives, isn't it? It's been confirmed. I know that's the mountain you want me to take. Send somebody else, please. And God gets mad. You don't want God to be mad at you. He created things like thunder and lightning. And if he ever does what Bill Cosby once said, I brought you into this world, I can take you out of this world. <laughs> he means it because he did. But what I want us to see together today, guys, is this. God called Moses. God called David. God called Jonah. God called Paul. God called an uneducated man by the name of D.L. Moody. God called a country bumpkin named Billy Graham. And God's calling you. I don't know what he's calling you to. If you're here today and you don't know what God is calling you to, you need to turn off the phone and the computer and the TV and the radio in your truck. And you just need to ask God, speak. I'm really listening. And then when you hear his voice and those same excuses that Moses gave start to bubble to the top Remember Moses, but more importantly, remember God. Because God told Moses exactly what he wants us to hear today. Moses, it's not about you. It's about me. Hutch, it's not about you. It's about me. Ron, it's not about you. It's about me. Jefferson, it's not about you. It's about God. Ed, it's not about you. It's about God. Butch, it's not about you. It's about God. And we could say that to every single guy around every single table and every single person that's watching us on YouTube. It's about him. You see, God meets us in our weaknesses and our doubts, but not in our unwillingness. God meets us in our weaknesses and our doubts, but he does not meet us in our unwillingness. And our unwillingness could be standing in the way of someone else's freedom. When God calls your name and he gives you 
your marching orders. The only acceptable answer is yes. What's your response today? Father, we come into your presence this morning as men who are really, really good, like Moses was at making excuses for why we don't want to do what you're calling us to do. You are calling us to a life of faith. You're calling us to a life of trusting you. You're calling us to be a part of your story because it's not about us, it's about you. But when we are unwilling to say yes, not only are we being disobedient, but we very well may be standing in the way of someone else's freedom. So Father, I pray that you would help us today to learn from the example of Moses and not just say, here I am, but to say yes before you even make the request. Because if you're calling us to do it, there's no better place to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, good to see you this morning. God bless you for being here. Ron's coming back next week with third one out of 59. We only got four more years to go and we'll be done. All right. God bless you guys. Love you. We'll see you later.